Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining the Hurricane Webinar Series of 2020. Uh, welcome. This, this webinar series is brought to you by the National Hurricane Center and NOAA's Southeast Caribbean, Caribbean Regional Collaboration Team, which is one of eight regional collaboration teams across the country. This webinar will be recorded. As a courtesy to our presenter, all attendees are muted. So if you have a question, please type it in the question box. Uh, that's part of the GoToWebinar. There's a little question box there. Go ahead and type, and we'll try to get to your questions as um, shortly after the presentation. Uh, due to the high volume of, of attendees, some of the slides might be delayed. Uh, I've also included a handout there of the presentation in case you, uh, you're interested in uh, viewing it at a later time. Uh, we will include that along with the recording. Uh, so again, I just want to check if everyone can hear me and see me as well. If you can type that in the chat and let me know. All right, sounds good. Thank you. It looks like we have several people that are joining us. We have people from all over the state of Florida. I see people from even New Mexico that are joining us. Maybe they are interested in, in hurricanes as well. Uh, people all the way from the Caribbean. I see people from St. John on New York, uh, people from all the way from Lima, Peru. Thank you for joining people from Virginia and the Carolinas. I know we have a tropical storm out there. So, uh, so I hope this, the people in the Carolina in the South Carolina area are safe, uh, are taking care of themselves. I see people from Hawaii even that are joining us here too. So thank you. All right, so we're gonna get started. I'm going to introduce our next speaker and let me let, share with you that these are part of a series of webinars that, webinars that, we'll be, that we, are, we are hosting every Wednesday. Tomorrow, next Wednesday, uh, next week will be the last one and that will be in Spanish. So today we're gonna to hear from Dr. Jason Stipple and he's gonna to talk to us about the use of reconnaissance aircraft in weather forecast models. So hang on while I switch presenters. All right, Jason. Yeah, I'm locked up. I got a pinwheel, so it's gonna, oh. You got it? Yes, there it goes. I see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay. All right. Make sure. All right, we're good? We are good. Go ahead. Uh, okay. There we okay. go. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks, Early. So I'm going to talk today about the use of reconnaissance data and weather forecast models. Um, I am a meteorologist at the Hurricane Research Division. As uh, Shirley said, I'm one of her coworkers. And I have a long history of uh, working in data simulation for tropical cyclones. Current position, I work closely in the Environmental Modeling Center to optimize the use of the reconnaissance data into the models uh, for forecast improvement. Uh -oh. The data from its very collection point all the way uh, to getting into the models, and, and, and in terms of H work, really it affects how the model is is run. Uh, so my outline of my talk, I'm going to give an overview of the reconnaissance data that's collected and uh, how it's collected in terms of uh, the planes that we use and the data that we have. And then I'll move into a history of the reconnaissance usage in the models, uh, move forward with recent developments, and then talk a little bit about our future direction that we're moving in. So this is just a broad overview of, of what's collected, the instruments that are used, the data that's collected. Uh, we have four main types that make it into the models of the recon data. We have flight level data, drop sons, uh, the Doppler radar, which we call the TDR, and SFMR. On the right, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to show a graphic for each of these. On the right, we have an example of the P3. That's one of the NOAA aircraft that flies in. This is a flight into Hurricane Dorian, and these are uh, flight level uh, wind uh, wind barbs that show uh, with the direction and the intensity of the wind that the plane experienced as it flew through on its pattern through Dorian. This would be a typical P3 pattern. You can see color coded by the intensity of the wind, the very strong winds, category uh, near category five winds in, in the eye wall and weaker winds out, out, outside of that region. 
Um, so that's an example of what the flight level data that, that is collected. We have winds, temperature, and humidity that are directly observed uh, from the plane. Uh, next, we have drop sons. And so this graphic here, uh, this is actually a drop son pictured here falling. Um, and drop sons are dropped from the plane uh, to measure the winds, temperature, and humidity in a profile uh, from the plane's altitude down to the surface. So down here on the uh, bottom right, this graphic shows uh, actually a planned G4 flight, that's, that would be a NOAA plane, taking off from Lakeland here and going around Hurricane Dorian. Uh, this is another flight of Hurricane Dorian. All these little dots show where we would be dropping drop sons. So, you know, you might have 35 of these drops into a uh, typical, uh, from a G4 flight into a hurricane. The P3 and other planes also drop them. Uh, the uh, Doppler radar, uh, uh, abbreviated, in the remainder of this talk, I'll talk, I'll use TDR, it's actually tail Doppler radar because it's mounted in the tail. Uh, it estimates the 3D wind field in the storm. So here is uh, actually the, the uh, instrument itself. Uh, I think that's, this is on the uh, G4, I believe. Um, and you can, as I said, estimate the 3D wind field. So this is actually an analysis uh, of Hurricane Dorian from the tail Doppler radar. This would have been from the P3 TDR. Uh, and you can see, again, very strong winds here in the eye wall, but we only collect uh, the, the, the wind data where there's actual precipitation uh, with the TDR. So you can see uh, there's, there's not full precipitation coverage in the, in the entire region where the, uh, the plane flies, so you have you know, splotchy uh, areas where you don't get, uh, where there's no rain. But nevertheless, this gives us our best volume coverage of, 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 of data in terms of three-dimensional because you can get, you know, all the way to the top of the storm down to near the ocean surface, uh, this, these wind estimates. And then finally, we have uh, the step frequency microwave radiometer, abbreviated SFMR. Uh, that's also mounted on all the planes. You can see here it is on the P3 right here. It's on the wing. And that provides estimates for the wind speeds directly beneath the plane. Um, and so these green lines here, this was uh, another uh, flight into Dorian. Uh, this is just going forward in time along the, 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 along the path of the plane. You can see we transect the eye wall, uh, really strong winds. Uh, looks like these were 100 knot winds. So that would have been roughly a category three. And we go in and out, in and out. Um, we had three eye wall, uh, eye transects on this particular flight. So what planes are used? Now I've, I've kind of outlined the data, but of course they are all, all these instruments are mounted on planes. By, by and large, uh, the greatest amount of, of, of flights is are from the C-130s, the hurricane hunters from the Air Force. Uh, they, they provide the bulk of the surveillance uh, from our program. They're all tasked by the Hurricane Center uh, to gather TC vitals data and, uh, and, and provide center fixes for the location and the intensity and the, and the size of the storm. So here is a picture of one of the C-130s on this top graphic and, and down below, this is the typical C-130 alpha pattern. Uh, they fly uh, these two transects and they use these two transects to do a center fix. Uh, so the, these planes send real-time data, including the drop sons, the flight level observations, which are actually shown in this graphic right here. These are flight level winds, as well as the SFMR uh, wind speed and, and rain rate. One thing that these planes miss is the Doppler radar data. Uh, they don't they don't send the radial they don't have uh, the capability of sending radial velocity back to uh, back to Earth um, uh, to put into the models. It's something we'd like to have, but we don't have this at this time. Uh, so a typical C-130 mission flies anywhere from one to 10,000 feet, depending on the intensity of the system. It has a range of about 3,200 nautical miles for a 10 hour flight. Uh, the the so-called fixes that they provide uh, have a frequency of anywhere between three and 24 hours, depending on the threat to the US interest. For example, a, a landfalling major hurricane would definitely have three hour fixes, but something that you know might not be a US threat directly um, or is, is, is kind of a minor threat would be something more like a 24 hour fix uh, frequency. On the NOAA side, so that was the Air Force side. On the NOAA side, we also have three planes. We have two uh, P3s, which is shown here, and those are uh, prop planes and a G4. 
And so P3s are used in the storm, a G4 is a jet that's used for high altitude surveillance around and near the storm. Uh, here is a typical range of the P3 uh, shown from various locations where we would take off. You can go outside these circles, although the farther outside you go, uh, your, your in-storm uh, flight time, uh, on station time, so, call, uh, so to speak, is, is less than desirable. But for example, we've also targeted storms in this region in the Gulf of Mexico and, and, and down in the Caribbean and, and further out in the Atlantic. You just can't stay on as long. Uh, but that gives you an idea of what our capability is uh, with the P3. So all three of these aircraft, uh, the, both the P3s and the G4 transmit drop sons, flight level ops, the, uh, SFMR wind speeds and rain rate, and also the Doppler radar data. So again, these, the, the Doppler radar data is unique to these planes. Uh, and that all is sent back into the models and, and, and assimilated. Typical G4 mission flies, uh, reaches its peak cruise altitude just above 40,000 feet, uh, has a range of 3,600 nautical miles for an eight hour flight. Uh, this is a jet, so it can fly uh, faster than the P3. So the P3 flies at, at 10,000 feet, typically, although it can go higher. Um, and it has a range of 2,100 nautical miles for that same eight-hour flight. So in 2018, we had a real blockbuster year uh, in terms of uh, just the number of storms and the intensity of the storms. Uh, Hurricane Florence became almost a Category 5. Michael made landfall as a Category 5, and Lane was also a Category 5 out in the East Pacific Ocean. And this, uh, these graphics show how we sampled those storms. So all this is flight level data that, as I showed before, these are all color-coded uh, flight level uh, wind vectors, or wind, wind barbs, as well as locations of drop sons. And uh, the center fixes are all here in white. I guess these would have been from the vortex data messages that are sent in. So it gives you an idea of the amount of sampling that we do over the life cycle of the system. In the case of Florence and Lane, uh, we started sampling this, the systems when they became when they came within range. And in terms of in Michael, it was always within range. So we got the whole a whole storm almost. So in 2018, we had nearly 120 missions into 15 different tropical systems. Uh, over 1,900 drop sons were deployed, and at one point we had simultaneous operations from Hawaii, the Caribbean, and the U.S. East Coast. Our resources were uh, actually pretty strained at that point because we were so spread out with different uh, taskings in different locations. Here's a zoom in of, of Michael. You can see the concentration of, of the flights, of the flight level data, all uh, close to the inner core, and a bunch of drop sons uh, near the center of the system. Out here, these would have been G4 drop sons. Uh, there's very less flight level data is sent from the G4. There's only uh, one reliable data point. I think it's temperature. The winds and the humidity aren't, aren't uh, currently reliable from the G4, so you don't see these, these, these flight level data uh, plotted uh, for the G4 flights. But we do get a lot of drop sons, which are valuable, and the TDR data from that aircraft. Uh, so here is a kind of a time evolution of what our flights into Michael looked like. So in white, we have the US Air Force flights uh, starting when it was in its early tropical storm phase. Uh, the PT joined in a bit later, as well as G4. I think there might have been a P3 flight a little bit earlier, but I might be misremembering. But regardless, we have really, really good data coverage from all the planes through Michael's uh, almost unprecedented rapid intensification to Category 5 as uh, right up until landfall. Uh, and so we've got uh, great data going into the models and it's, it provides a good research data set as well. And, and you know, we have the same from other, many other storms. Uh, now that we're using this data more in the models, there's, there's actually more demand for, for these flights. And, and so it provides some good research opportunities too. Uh, here are all the P3 flights in the Michael. You can see this typical P3 butterfly pattern. That's what we call this pattern here, where you have these, these three triangles uh, that, that put these passes through the center. And this was the G4. You can see the, the patterns are much more spread out. We have more environmental sampling, uh, although we do do some flights uh, segments closer to the center to gather that tailed up of radar data. In 2019, 
we also have a lot of missions, 120 missions into 13 tropical systems. Almost 2,700 drop sons were deployed, and we had over 50 flights into Hurricane Dorian. So this is Dorian right here. And again, we captured almost the entire life cycle of Dorian. It's, it's really an unprecedented data set, uh, going from um, the tropical early tropical storm phase. I'm not sure if we got the TD tropical depression phase, but uh, tropical storm through its uh, rapid intensification all the way through its uh, really um, un unprecedented category five status as it sat here over the Bahamas and then brushed the US coast. So it, the, the flights ended as it moved out over the ocean and became uh, not a threat to the US. So moving on from the overview of the reconnaissance now, I'm gonna take a, take a, a step back and talk about the history of its usage in the models. And that goes back to 1997, where we first began using drop sons uh, from the NOAA G4, that high altitude jet. Uh, those drop sons began going into the, the global forecast system, the global model that is used from, from the US. And so about 10 to 15 years later, some assessments were made of the impact of all drop sons in the global model, the GFS. And this graphic here on the left is, it comes from one of those studies. It's Sim Everson, one of my coworkers, did, did the work, uh, and it's a paper published in 2011. So what this shows is the drop son impact on uh, tropical cyclone tracks in that model, and in terms of percent improvement. So the zero line is here in the middle. Anything above zero is positive improvement. Anything below zero is negative improvement. Now all the thin lines, that are different colors show uh, the impacts in the various basins. Now, th this is this is a global ass assessment. So there were some basins where we didn't have drop sons drop, but there were drop sons in the Atlantic, in the East Pacific, I think, and in the West Pacific. Um, and the most important line here is really this dark black bolt line that shows, on average, how those drop sons drop from, the, from all planes impacted the tracks of all global tropical cyclones. You can see there's, for the first three days, for the first 72 hours, you have about a 10% a positive impact on the tracks. And then as you go out to five days, it trails off uh, to near zero by, by, by 120 hours, but still we're all, always in positive territory on average here. So uh, that was definitely a motivation to continue the work with the drop sons and, and actually to expand it to, to, to use the drop sons more frequently to, to try to impact the tracks in the uh, prediction models. So for a long time, that was it. That was all that, that made it into the models. We couldn't really use the uh, inner core data, the, the Doppler radar, the flight level winds, um, the SFMR. Uh, the models just weren't to a point where they could use the data. But we, we began to get there uh, in the, the first decade of, of, of this century. And in 2008, uh, I was, uh, involved with the study, it was actually, we started work in 2007, there was a, a hurricane that made uh, a landfall on the upper Texas coast, Hurricane Umberto. And in, in 24 hours, it went from nothing, just a few thunderstorms, not even a tropical depression, uh, to a, a category one hurricane. It caught everybody off guard because none of the models predicted it. Um, and it, it was a big surprise. This is actually observations uh, from the radar of the storm as it was spinning up and then after it made landfall here on the left. So as, as part of my doctoral work, uh, we assimilated the Doppler velocity data from a few of these Doppler radars along the coast into uh, some, some regional model forecasts. And we came up with uh, analyses of, of the storm that, that were improved. So what we found was that assimilating this radio velocity data from the 88D network here along the coast significantly improved these forecasts of Hurricane Umberto. And here on the left, you can see these are the observations. On the right, these are actually simulations with uh, the data being assimilated. And, 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 and it looks a lot like the actual observations. We didn't assimilate the reflectivity data, but you get a good uh, an assessment of the structure of the storm um, just by assimilating the rate of, velocity, rate of velocity data. So this is not reconnaissance, but this is the background of 
how we started getting the reconnaissance data into the models. This was the very preliminary work on the research side that led down the path for getting this data into the models. And so you can see on the top here, uh, we have forecasts. So I showed the reflectivity data to show this, the structure of the system and it looked good. But here we have a comparison of forecasts with no Doppler velocity data versus with Doppler velocity data. Uh, and here's the observation here. This is the best track. You can see it made it to 40 meters per second, which is a category one hurricane, mid category one hurricane. You can see without the Doppler velocity data, you don't get any development really. It, it, the forecasts are all very poor. But when you start assimilating this Doppler velocity data, you can see uh, it's not a perfect forecast, but you begin to capture the rapid intensification in these forecasts with, the, with that data in. So that was uh, the groundwork that led to further work um, showing how this, this inner core data could impact couple cyclone forecasts. So we moved forward to Hurricane Ike, uh, which was in 2008. And this was some of the very first work where, a, uh, where the data that was gathered from the P3, the tail Doppler radar data, was actually assimilated into a a regional modeling system and the forecast impact was shown and that's here on the left we have the best track of, of Ike in, in black uh, it made landfall as a very strong category 2 hurricane in the Houston area did a tremendous amount of damage a lot of storm surge I think it's 16 16 plus feet of surge a lot of water damage in that area and what we see is that in the official for the, the official not the official forecast but the official uh inset models were forecasting a system that was actually much too strong compared to observations you can see they were forecasting the models at the time showing 60 meters per second that's a category uh four pretty strong category four hurricane and indeed the official forecast which is here uh was was tugged by those by those erroneous forecasts and it was also a bit too strong uh, compared to the actual reality which was down here which was a strong category two but when that regional modeling system assimilated that tail doppler radar data which is here in red this is these are all intensity forecasts you can see that it had a really really good match to the wind speed that was actually observed uh, by the storm and furthermore i don't have it here but it produced a good track as well so this was the, the very first paper that, that showed that assimilating that this tail Doppler radar data could improve uh, these, these forecasts. And it really led to a dedicated effort to assimilate this data operationally. So that happened in 2013 with the uh, HWARP, the Hurricane Weather Research and Forecasting Model. That's uh, NCEP's flagship hurricane model. And we saw really good results for weak systems when we first put it in. You can see here, uh, this is actually the, the very first time it was assimilated for Tropical Storm Karen in the Gulf of Mexico. And so the H4 forecast, we have an H4 forecast on top here with no TDR data going in. You can see the storm got way too intense. It, it, it was forecasting, H4 was forecasting a, a 75 knot hurricane, whereas in reality, we were down here at tropical depression strength. Um, you look at a cycle where we add the TDR data in and it knocks the intensity way down. It's still not perfect, it has that high bias in the intensity. But the, the impact of this tail Doppler radar data is immediately noticed. And it was really best for the weak systems. We had a lot of struggles for the first few years with the stronger systems due to deficiencies in the model and the data simulation systems. But, but we did have some immediate benefits. So moving forward, this is how the use of the reconnaissance data evolved in H4. That's actually, this chart shows how data simulation in, in total evolved in H4 from 2011 to 2020, so over the last decade. But I, I want, really wanna highlight the reconnaissance data usage in particular. So we have, uh, in 2013, we added this uh, P3 Doppler velocity data. That same year, we also began uh, assimilating some dropsons uh, from the operational aircraft, but not all of them, not, not, not in the inner core. 
uh, the, the model just couldn't, the data simulation system couldn't handle it. But we've had a lot of data simulation, data simulation developments in HWARF over the years. Those are all in bold black. And so in 2017, we started adding the flight level winds and temperature and humidity. In 2018, the SFMR got in and also the, all the drop zones uh, uh, got in. Starting in 2018, we, we have some special processing we do of, of some of the drop zones that are, uh, or actually all the drop zones, but it's really most important for the ones in the eye wall because they, they travel so far around, they can go all the way around the eye wall. And so we have to handle those uh, really uh, with great care. And then the G4 Doppler velocity. So initially we were only using the, the tail Doppler radar from the P3, but then in 2018, we started using the G4 uh, TDR. And, and then coming into H4 this year, uh, more intercore data, we're using uh, the Doppler velocity from the WSR 88D network, which is also found to have, as I, as I showed previously, a good impact on the forecast, and it does in each work as well. So I've been involved with a lot of this data simulation development work. I've worked very closely with EMC, and, and since about 2016 is, is uh, when I came into the picture and started doing a lot of this work down here. So what is the impact in each work of this reconnaissance data? Uh, we did a repack uh, in, in 2019, we did a recon impact assessment on, on the HWARF forecasts, and we really wanted to see how adding this reconnaissance data uh, it changed the intensity forecast in HWARF. There were a lot of major hurricanes in this, this sample. Uh, all the high impact storms like Irma, Maria, Michael, uh, Florence, anything between 2016 and 18, there was a high impact US landfalling storm. Uh, we we included in the sample. And those are actually the hardest to get. At category five, it's really hard to improve with these this inner core data due to issues with the data simulation of the model. But nevertheless, we saw that when we added the reconnaissance data, so this is the intensity error, uh, the black line is lower, meaning uh, lower errors when we add the data than when we don't have the data. And in terms of uh, forecast skill, percent impact, we're looking at about a 10% impact in 10% in, in improvement in the errors through about 72 hours. Uh, now this is just specific to HWARF. It doesn't include uh, uh, the impacts on FE3. So there would be further uh, positive impacts presumably there as well. Uh, but it, it's good to see that, that we're moving in the right direction. And I wanna say that I, I, I suspect that the impact in the current operational HWARF is gonna be even greater because uh, we had some issues in this particular release of H work that we've worked out, and we've seen a big improvement in how, example, the drop signs impact the forecast. So, uh, moving forward uh, now through the history of the usage and its impact, I want to talk a little bit about some recent developments. Um, in particular, uh, how the the planes are used. Uh, one of the big developments is, is with the G4. In the past, you can see. We have this, this G4 pattern here and where the drop signs are dropped. But in the past, we would not have included, we would not have had a, a, this inner ring of drop signs around a tropical cyclone. I think this is one of the flights into Florence. But recent research uh, elsewhere and at HRD showed that, that if you drop more signs near the center, it actually has a better impact on the track forecast. So given that research and the motivation to actually get more data from the G4 tail Doppler radar shown here, uh, we began including this inner ring uh, on the flight to, to gather these drop signs and then gather this TDR data. And here, this is just an analysis of the, of the winds, the low level winds in Florence from the G4 TDR data. So that wouldn't be possible when you, on this outer ring out here, you just can't, the, the, there's not enough rain out there to make a meaningful analysis for that Doppler velocity data. So you really need this inner ring. So we, we have this uh, double benefit with the drop signs and the additional radar data. So that's used uh, as, as possible if there's uh, enough uh, time in the flight to get this inner ring. This is done operationally now on every flight. And we've done some work to show that these, these drop signs near the center uh, indeed are uh, improving the forecast more. 
We also have changed the way the Air Force flights, the C-130 missions, um, the flights are the same, but what, one thing we do differently now is we do these drop sons at these endpoints. Historically, over the past decade, they were only dropping drop sons near the center, which would be here, and maybe at the radius of maximum winds. But given uh, knowledge we've gained over the past decade or so, that the drop sons are actually having a lot of impact, uh, we, on a preliminary basis, added these endpoint drop sons here on this typical C-130 alpha pattern, and then did an assessment of the impact on the skill. And here you can see for H4, uh, again, this is in skill, uh, in terms of skill. Uh, so positive is good, negative is bad. For the most part, we're looking at uh, positive skill gain from uh, adding these drop zones, up to 10% impact on the intensity forecast. So based on these results, this practice was implemented operationally in 2018, uh, same year as the, uh, as the G4 uh, pattern change was implemented. So moving in the future, uh, NOAA actually has acquired uh, a high altitude jet to replace or supplement the G4. Uh, this is a big deal because the, the, the new G4, it's the G5, can fly both higher and ha can, uh, is capable of longer duration flights. So it gives us more flexibility in what we can do with that particular jet. We're also looking at smarter environmental targeting in the works. And what I mean by this is uh, figuring out where to drop the drop sons uh, to have the biggest impact on the forecast. You can see this graphic here on the right is actually a graphic that shows you how much you can potentially improve the forecast uh, by selecting where to drop the drop sons. So the cold colors show that you, if you drop in the, these regions, you wouldn't have as much of an impact, but down here south of the storm center for this particular storm, you can have a, a big impact on the forecast by dropping down there. So that is a uh, tool that will is actually being used now to, to, to plan the G4 flights at the Hurricane Center um, when it's possible. And we're also looking at a major cost-benefit assessment of recon practices. This was uh, funded by the Hurricane Supplemental. And we're really interested in, uh, again, uh, what flight patterns are most beneficial and where to drop the drop zones. Uh, the initial work on this is looking at drop zones closer in to the storm, within the inner 250 kilometers or so, versus those further out. But we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of work with this. Um, here's some uh, some flight patterns that that are uh, used right now in operations. We have the the alpha pattern up here in the top left, and where drop zones might be dropped with that pattern versus the butterfly pattern and the rotated figure four pattern. So really. The, the goal is to figure out what drop sons are needed because they're not free. They're $800 or so a pop. And so for the improvement of the forecast, we want to know which ones are, are giving us the biggest bang for our buck. So this is, this is underway. I'm involved with this project. And you know, in the, the future, it really should help us to, to focus in on, on what we can do to, to use the reconnaissance. To, to improve the forecast the most. So in conclusion, uh, NOAA really has an extensive TC reconnaissance program focused on uh, forecast improvement for US threats. The missions are increasingly focused on gathering data from in and near uh, the TC vortex, and, and we have this uh, systematic evaluation of the reconnaissance best practices underway with results forthcoming over the next several years. And I do have one bonus slide here. This shows you the history of this is not directly related to the reconnaissance data, but this is the history of uh, intensity errors, the median intensity error in H4 over the past 10 years, uh, just as a function of year from 2011 to 2018. I didn't include 2019 in there. But you can see in the early years, uh, H4 was, was pretty bad. Uh, median errors up near you know 16 to 20 knots in the extended. But in, over the last few years, we've really, really improved the model a lot. And, we've, and part of this is because we've improved the way the reconnaissance data is usage. So now, you know, in 2018, despite having uh, two near category, one category five and one near category five system that are notoriously difficult to forecast, we have median errors down around 10 knots. That's a 50% decrease in the errors uh, from 10 years ago. So the intensity forecasts are getting a lot better. And they continue to, to do so every year. I know this, this, this current implementation of HWARP that's going in in 2020 looks really promising. It looks even better than, than this, this 2018 version. Uh, we'll see what the real-time results are, but, but uh, it's set, certainly showing us that we're moving in the right direction. So 
with that, uh, I that concludes my presentation, and I I guess uh, turning it back over to Shirley to field questions. Yes, thank you, Jason. Let me turn on yeah. my video. There I am. All right, so we have a couple of questions. That was very insightful. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's start with a few questions here. Uh, what is the criteria for determining when the planes will go out to inspect and gather data on a storm? So the Hurricane Center has their criteria um, really based on the threat to U.S. interests um, and, and how big that threat is. And it's more or less the same from HRD, from our taskings. Uh, we look for storms. I, I, we're, we probably have a little bit of a broader interest than the Hurricane Center does. Uh, we might target something a little bit earlier or maybe something that doesn't have as definite as a threat to the US. And we also have research flights that we, we fly that, that are not necessarily uh, geared towards US threats. Like there were flights into Lorenzo last year, which was out over the open ocean. Although uh, serendipitously, um, I guess you could say, those flights wound up being uh, participating in search and rescue efforts for a, a tugboat that, that got stranded out there in the storm. So that just shows you even, even uh, out over the open ocean, um, these reconnaissance efforts can have positive benefits, even if there's not a land threat. I lost your audio. There I am. Okay. Any general thoughts on the impact of UAS observations, like NASA Global Hawk or any smaller UAS? Right, so I was involved in, a, in an assessment of the Global Hawk, uh, and we've actually done a few of them. And in the GFS, before the transition to FE3, it was having a huge impact on the track forecast. It was like 15%. Uh, a lot of those were open ocean storms without other recon, and so I think there was a lot of opportunity to improve the forecast there. Uh, we did a, a reassessment in the FE3 version of the GFS, and the impact was a bit smaller, but still quite positive. Um, as far as the UAS goes, I, I, there's small UAS that are released from the P3s, and that actually is a project that has been funded, and we're going to look at the impact of those in, in H4 over the next couple of years, and in, in the, up, the next generation of hurricane forecast systems. So don't have a direct answer on the smaller UAS, but at least with a global hawk, uh, we know that there is a uh, quite a big benefit in, in both the H4 and in the global model. All right, thank you for that. Uh, who other than NOAA do the hurricane hunters collaborate and coordinate with? I actually don't know. Do you know, Shirley? Yeah, so I can answer this. So during the season, we are collaborating mostly with, with NOAA and our other uh, line offices like the Weather Service. But off season, the hurricane hunters do travel throughout the country, throughout the world, uh, to do other types of uh, atmospheric data collection. They even go to other countries uh, to do field campaigns, looking at dust, looking at air pollution. So they are used uh, uh, year round. All right, uh, let's see, we have a question. Uh, what is the added benefit of land-based upper air sites doing special uh, releases for, for models? So I know that, that there was actually a recent assessment of this, and it's, it's, it's been mixed in the past. There was one year they did an assessment, and it didn't look like, I, I believe it didn't look like they were having, uh, they had a big impact for one particular season, but then the last one they did, uh, maybe in 2018, uh, they had they they had a big impact on the forecast, uh, the track forecast for GFS. So that was really encouraging. Um, and actually, this targeting software that was developed by Ryan Torn is actually being used to show where we should be also deploying the special releases for the upper air. Um, it's it's informing those decisions. So we may not necessarily need to release upper air observations for every uh, upper air station in the US, we could we could focus on the ones that really matter the most. Uh, and we, we are beginning to see be, be able to see where that where that is. 
All right, thank you. I am reminded as well that we do partner with NASA and the US Navy when we do our flights and our field campaign. Thank you for reminding me that, of course. Yeah, we've, we've had several sure. flight campaigns in, in previous seasons that we do partner with NASA and the US Navy. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, do other countries have similar hurricane cyclone typhoon hunters? So I know that Taiwan does. They have a G4 type aircraft that does surveillance and they, they're actually a little more bold than we are and they they fly into the storm with their their high altitude jet and there's actually safety reasons why we don't do that and this has come up before um but but they're doing that and uh they're i think hong kong is doing it some but by and large the u.s has the most expansive recon uh, recon program by an order of magnitude. All right, let's see what other. So we've got several questions on this and how quickly does the drops on data get into the models? So is so, it minutes, hours? So does it happen during the flight or after we land? It's all during the flight. So these flights, are we have to pay very special attention. The models run on, on a six hour uh, forecast, uh, six hour window for gathering data. And so we have to get all the data in from the plane to the ground into EMC for the models to assimilate. And that includes all the pre-processing of all the data and everything. All this has to happen before the data cutoff window uh, or else the, the, the data that we collect doesn't uh, from that flight doesn't get in to the model and then you lose the benefit. So we're always mindful of this forecast window and where we are in the window and, and, and in terms of data, data gathering. Uh, so, you know, it's you know, at most um, on average, it's gonna be like an hour or, or maybe two, but really some of it is it's, you know, we're collecting data at the end of the window and it still makes it in. So it's, that's less than an hour. That's like, you know, half an hour from the collection to actually EMC has the data in their hands to be able to use the models. All right. Uh, we've gotten several questions on, on the drop songs and if they're recoverable or not. Uh, so I'm going to lump all of these together. Uh, yeah, so people are asking if the drop songs are recovered. Does someone go on a boat and pick them up? Uh, you know. Nope. Nope. It's, it's $800 a pop. And so we want to make sure that we're using them in the most effective way possible. And here's a comment from one of our colleagues, uh, Rich Henning, saying thanks to Leonard Min Miller at AOC, we think we have found the problem with flight level winds on the G4 and plan Fantastic. on including them again in the upcoming season in our HD OBS. That's good news. I expect that's, that is wonderful news because those upper air winds are going to have a big impact on the forecast. That's really, really good to hear. Uh, someone was saying that they are surprised that Australia does not have a hurricane hunter team. Yeah, I, I can't speak for other countries, you know. All right. Uh, uh, we were reminded that Taiwan, that the hurricane hunters at, or the typhoon hunters, I would say, in Taiwan, they fly around the storm. And the Hong Kong, the folks in Hong Kong, they fly into the storm. So just to make that distinction. Here's a question for you, Jason. Is this additional data also being used in the European models? So the drop sons do make it to the European models. I like the TDR does not. I do not know about the flight level winds, the HDOBs uh, and the SFMR. Uh, I'm not sure on those, but I know that the TDR doesn't. We're, I, there's talks about you know making this uh, data available for anybody to simulate, but right now it's just getting to EMC. All right. Let me look for other questions here. I see a comment from one of uh, our Hurricane Research Division director saying, Humberto's development was similar to Bertha spinning up this morning. Uh, and yes, there's a was. question talking about Bertha. Are there planes out there right now flying Bertha? So I don't think there are, and this is actually, 
situations like this is 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 really where using the 88D data from the uh, from the US NextRad network is really going to be beneficial uh, because this data is now going to be with the upcoming HWARP implementation. It's I think it's in June or July when the 2020 version of HWARP gets in. We're going to start be assimilating this rate of velocity data from NextRad. And so situations like this where we don't immediately have reconnaissance in the plane, we can still have this, this data uh, in our core going in and impacting the forecast. So that's going to be really helpful. That's a, that's a really a big deal for, for U.S. Uh, coastal systems. All right. Uh, can you elaborate more on when it is important to fly one of the NOAA P3s versus a C-130? So I, I would love to fly the P3s all the time if we could, <laughs> but um, we only have two of them. There are, I think there are nine C-130s, nine or 10. They have uh, crews for, for all of them. They can be deployed to three different locations. Uh, whereas the P3s, there's only uh, crews enough to do two flights a day. Uh, so there's a crewing limitation from AOC. Um, so that really, we can't even do two flights a day from, from both planes. And that's just a resource constraint right now. Um, but the, the P3s, it would be great to be able to use them uh, more uh, and, and more frequently, just what we have, what we have available right now. I am not seeing any more questions. Let me just look again here. Okay, so there's one on, if you plan for six storms and the season has seven or eight storms of interest, how does that affect the analysis for later storm events? I, I guess the, the question is is if we use our resources at a quicker rate and then I, I guess they're I'm, I'm trying to interpret what what the point of the question is I, I'm, I'm guessing so, maybe, that it's, so let's say if it is the model doing like uh, you know I, I'm thinking of like neural network is it learning more because it has more uh, mod more storms that it is that we are sampling and you're putting that data into the forecast models is it learning more is it adapting i guess that's kind of where the question is is coming from um i yeah i there's the, the actual memory of the reconnaissance say within the model you know it, it probably lasts for for if you sample it, it one morning it will have an impact on maybe a, for a day after that the forecast for a day after that but you got to continue to, to gather data throughout the life cycle of the storm to continue to have that impact. So there definitely is not any uh, uh, long-term impact of just flying once, for example. Uh, if, that's, if that's really where the question is going, I'm not sure. Okay. There's a question on, would you use Navy P3s? These are Navy P3s. I mean, they're, they're modified Navy P3s. Um, highly modified, but it's still the same plane. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, did Noah inspire the devices in the movie Twister, or did the movie inspire Dropson? I think Dropsons were, have been around for a very long time, long before Twister. Uh, many decades before Twister. Um, I, I think there's actual, um, there is a correlation between the little instruments they have in Twister and they do release similar uh, instruments in the tornadoes, but that's not really related to the hurricane we talked about. Uh, someone's asking about when is the target date for the new G4, the G550 in G5? this case? Yeah. Do you know, certainly, I don't know. I, it's, Somebody from AOC I is, I guess, online. They could re respond. I don't want to speak for them. Yeah, I, I think it's to come. I would say, yeah. you know, in a in couple in years. coming yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a couple years out. I don't know exactly when, but. 
All right, let's see. I've got quite other questions are coming in when we have plenty. We have a couple more minutes left. Um, let's see. I think we're good with questions. Yes, we are. So let me share my screen because I've gotten some questions on okay. where your presentation is going to be available in this recording. So thank you everyone for those questions. Hang on while I switch presenters here. Uh, so again, thank you everyone. Next week, we will have our final presentation of the series and we will that presentation will be in spanish let me open my here we go so some folks were asking where you would find the slides uh, you can go to this website called regions.noaa.gov uh, slash CCAR, short for a Southeast Regional Caribbean uh, team. Again, I'd like to thank our speaker, Dr. Jason Sippel from the Atlantic Oceanographic Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, Florida. And again, my name is Shirley Murillo. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hurricane Research Division, which is located part of AOML, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. Thank you again. Uh, and join us next week for a final presentation in Spanish where we're gonna talk about, uh, let's see if I have it here. Um, these were the ones that we had discussed. Uh, we're gonna talk about the lessons learned from the 2018 and 2019, not 29, not 29 hurricane season, because that hasn't happened yet, but 2019 hurricane season. And this will be given by Roberto Garcia. He's the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Thank you again, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.